So today, again, the message is it's called crossing over. So we're going to help you activate your faith. Hallelujah. Somebody say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So first off, we need to know that the devil cannot, I say cannot, keep you or talk you out of your blessing. That's the first thing. Because you know he sends the fiery darts. So I say he cannot do that. Because you need to simply just look over the Jordan River to the, bank, to the banks. Let's think about that for a minute. We know Joshua, he went over the Jordan River, but we saw, as he looked over the Jordan River, he saw the banks. He saw what he perceived to be muddy banks. But when you cross over your Jordan River, you're going to look over at your banks. Your banks. Now, let's take that. Let's think about that for a minute. Your banks across your river, your Jordan River. Let's presume you have a river you need to cross. And on the other side of that river is banks. How many got multiple banks? Come on. How many got more than one bank account? Come on. If you don't have more than one bank account, you need to have more than one. You know what they say, you don't put all your marbles in one basket. Come on, somebody. you got to have multiple banks. If you're going to flow in elevation, if you're going to flow in prosperity, you need to have multiple banks. The reason being, if one bank bellies up, you have another one you can fall back on. And when you open a new bank, make sure that the, the, make sure that the new bank is working properly before you close the old one. But you need to always have multiple banks. So your Jordan River requires you to look across it because you've got to cross over. And you must see your banks. So if you're looking at your banks and you see what's in them, then you need to put some more in them, don't you? And you know, the thing about with God is, is that when you invest, you expect a return. When you invest, you expect a return. But if you don't put nothing in the bank, when times get hard, you can't draw on it. Here's Joshua having to cross over the River Jordan to the bank. To his banks, which was money. But guess what? Over in that bank, there was lots of victories. Across the bank, there was lots of victories. So we need to be looking at that. And I want you to think about that for a minute as we look into this and see what Joshua saw. Now, Joshua had 31 battles when he got across the River Jordan to the land of milk and honey. He had 31 battles. He only lost one. He lost one because he failed to seek God. He failed to seek the advice of God. He failed to seek the counsel of God. And that's the battle he lost. But he recouped because he went back to God, repented, got back on his knees, got back on track, and went and defeated that battle. So as you cross over your Jordan, you're in the line of milk and honey, but there are battles that you have to fight. There are battles that you have to conquer. But notice the analogy here is that when you cross over your Jordan, you must stay with God. If you fall back like Joshua did, then the enemy, your bank account, could get jacked up. So we begin to kind of relate. So you must see your harvest, and it's waiting for you on the other side. You must see your harvest, and it's waiting for you on the other side. So you've got to cross over. You, you've got to do something. You've got to make something happen. You just can't rest on your laurels on this side. You've got to go across and put some money in your banks. And then once you put money in your banks, then you've got to what? You've got to do business over there. You've got to take out the enemy. You cannot rest on your laurels. So then after you do this, you will begin to see your thing. And your thing will begin, as I like to say, become your blessing. Now again, I say I'm going to activate your faith today. 
Now you understand that if you got one bank, you need to open up another. And you need to put something in that bank. Now this is what God told me to tell you today because it's to activate your faith. You are to, when you tithe, because your tithe does not belong to you. That belongs to God. You need to understand that. Scripture support that statement. So that's what you give to God because it doesn't belong to you in the first place. So we need to understand that right off the bat. So I want to emphasize that as we move in this today. Now, notice again your tithe is your first fruit to God. It, it doesn't belong to you. But your offering today, here's what I want you to do with your offering. I want you to, this is what the Lord said, because we're activating your faith. Your offering today, I want you to make an offering. Whatever that offering is, God said that you're going to also take the same amount and put in your bank account. Whatever offering it is that you offer to God, you're going to take that offering and put it in your bank account. In your bank, you're going to make that same amount of deposit. And God says that he's going to multiply that threefold. Threefold in less than seven days. Now, I don't know this, but it could come in the form of a mailbox blessing. It could come in the form of a dividend check that you could be expecting. But this is what the Lord says. That you are to, after your tithe, you are to make an offer. Now, that offering could be for whatever you like, but it should be an offering. And that same amount, you are to deposit that same amount into your bank account, at least one bank account. What is that doing, actually, Pastor? It's activating your faith. Because if you're going to cross over the River Jordan in your life, then you need to understand that there has to be some type of sacrifice. Come on. In other words, you can't rest on your laurels on this side of the river. You need to cross over. And if you're going to cross over, then you need to start believing God for more than what you believe in God for. Yeah. You can't sit on and rest on your laurels. The children of Israel tried that, and it didn't work. God didn't allow them to rest on their laurels. Now, with that, I just wanted to give you that because you need to be thinking about that as God begins to speak to your spirit today and your activation of your faith becomes a reality. Now, I've got some good news for you today and some great news. And I, I, and I notice it, it's not fake news, but it's great news. Now, I need to step out on faith on you today with this one. Now, the good news is I'm going to be a millionaire. Hallelujah. Now, I need to rephrase that because it's not that I'm going to be a millionaire. I'm already a millionaire. Come on. Now, that's the good news. And you say, Pastor, what's the great news? The great news is that you're going to be a millionaire with me. Did you forget about my father's house? Did you forget about his table, how his table is large, how he's going to bless you like he's going to bless me? You are entitled to the same millionaire attitude, same millionaire possibilities. So you need to come out of the low living thinking. Yeah. I'm activating your faith today. Yeah. Why wouldn't you be a millionaire? Now let me help you again. The fact of the matter is some of you and your life right now, you have gone through millions of dollars. If you count up all the money that you have spent and wasted and threw away, you'll find out that you are a millionaire. You have let you millions have gone through your hand and through your pocket, through your bank account. See, wealth is like this. It's not about how much you make, but how much you keep. So see, you are a millionaire. That's the great news. The other, pos the other thing that you need to realize, you're sitting in a building that has an extensions, extensions of warehouses. You probably, some of you seen the trucks, uh, the warehouses, the trucks themselves are probably well worth up uh, to two or three million dollars. And then this building itself is another two or three million dollars. So you're sitting in millions of dollars. Yes. Why wouldn't you be a millionaire? Yes. God brought you to the land of milk and honey. Yes. So you all around millionaires. Some of you work for billion dollar companies. Yes. You should be all somebody. Yes. Okay. Oh God. 
God wants you to see this. The company, oh, listen, I don't even talk to a company. I don't even serve as a company unless they, their minimum that the requirement for me to serve as a company or come into their place of establishment, the minimum they must have $2.5 million or I don't talk to them. The millionaire mentality you have, this is what God is saying to you. You have the same, the same thing. Our mistake, as I've always said, you're looking at everybody else's wealth opposed to looking at what you have in your hand. God is wanting to bless you with yours. But you're too busy looking at somebody else's mm -hmm. in jealousy and in envy and in strife. That's not going to get you to the next level. Mm -hmm. Remember, you've got to cross over your Jordan yes. so that the millionaire mentality can overtake you. Mm -hmm. God wants you to have this millionaire mentality. He wants you to be a millionaire. I could go on. My wife's family, she's probably going to get me for this because some of y'all are going to tell her, They've got like 100 acres of land. And it's air property. So it's worth millions of dollars. So here's the thing. We're so surrounded by millions. Mm -hmm. We should start walking in the mentality of, 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 of millionaire, millionaire mentality. Yeah. Stop walking in the low living mentality. Yes. So here's, that's the great news. The, the thing about it here, we must remember, to whom much is given, though, much is required. God's going to bless you. But what you do with the blessing is key. The process is simple. Our problem is, is that we don't take the little bit that we have and apply it to something greater. See, this is why I told you, in terms of activation in your faith, you take a little and give that to God, so God can give back to you. Now, notice we're flowing in the kingdom principle. Not the worldly principle, but the kingdom principle. Oh, somebody, you tried the worldly principle. How, what's, how's that working for you? Uh, and so, see, we, we understand. So, But God is saying, I'm going to show you a better way in the kingdom. This is why this is so important today. Because we understand we came from a place of elevation. Do you all know the reason I say the inch by inch process? Let me step you through some things. Let me remind you of some things of where God has brought you. We we were over, you all remember we were over in the we were over in the hotel. We were over in the other tent. Come on. Uh, then when we was over there, Sister Mel, what did we do? We, we, we were all walking in there talking about we were surviving. And then what God said, no, you ain't surviving no more. We're going to start thriving. Then folks start getting breakthroughs, didn't they? Mentality start changing, didn't it? Then go in there, we said, well, Lord, we ready to move up on out of here because we ain't in no survival mode no more. We're sitting there, we're, all, we're in the thriving mode. We begin to thrive. We begin to walk. We begin to trust God. We begin to step out. And then God says, okay, y'all. I'm ready. God moved us over here. And then he said, well, I'm not through with you yet. Then he's done inching and inching and inching again. And then we said, well, listen, we need so much money, Lord, to move up in here. Then we got favor with the owner. The owner said, oh, come on in, Pastor Wade. We love y'all. Come on in here. Guess what? Then he said, I, then we said, we need to paint the, we need to paint this building. We painted the building. Then we came back and we said, oh, my wife, she wasn't satisfied. She never is. She said, we need to replace this carpet. Go! Somebody look over there in the corner. Yeah. The carpet is here. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yes. Do you understand that God is walking us through? Yes. He's bringing us through the oh, somebody, the millionaire mentality. Can you walk this thing out with me? Because yes. God wants you to be a millionaire too. Amen. This is why you're here. You need to be, you need your faith has to be activated. You gotta walk this out. Yes. The first thing, it's about applying God's wisdom. It's about applying his understanding. It's about applying his knowledge. It's about taking what's in our hands. Because I say again, wealth is not about what you made, it's about what you keep. If we 
he began to take the little bit. Oh, somebody. The first time I taught a business class to a Sunday school class about 10 years ago, the first thing I taught them, take your money. If you're not doing anything with it, put it in a money market. I said, they'll make a little money for you. That's not much, but it's a start. Then take that money, because some of them probably knew there was a lot of people that were afraid. I said, take that money and do a CD. It's a little money, but it's, a, it's something to start. Then I says, and then if you want to get, get a little bit better, let's, let's invest it in some other areas. Let's try. If you're comfortable, let's just pick up some stock. Let's buy a few, few, just a few, just a little bit. Buy a little of that. And then also I said, now, if you're ready, if you're ready, let's look at some acquiring some property. Notice, notice the, the baby steps. And what does God say when he talked about the, with, the wicked and slothful servant? We forget that, didn't we? He told the servant, the one he took one night, he put it in the ground. Didn't do anything with it. Everybody else did somebody, the one guy, he says, let, man, let me, let me just put it in the bank. At least I draw interest. The master was pleased. The other boy invested and bought other things, and he made double his money. And the master was so pleased with him, he said, no, you take what you have and what you made, take everybody else's. God says, he says, money begot more money. Oh, somebody. Faith begets more faith. Faith begot more faith. Faithfulness with God gets more faithfulness. God says, I'll draw closer to you if you draw closer to me. If you want my wealth, come on in. I'm going to give it to you. If you come on in, he said, if you got something, I'm going to give you more. Yeah. Yeah. You have to understand this principle of wealth with God in his kingdom. This is why. This is how we develop the millionaire mentality and move up and inch up. And keep notice, the reason I'm always telling you that, oh, an inch is a cent, but a mile is a trial, because you've got to start somewhere. If you be faithful over the little bit that God has given you, and, and oh, somebody tied off of that, God is going to multiply it. Yeah. But then, what we do, we hoard it, and that's just simply greed. Mm -hmm. Greedy person never gets nothing. That's a wakeful and slothful servant. Mm -hmm. Notice, again, we're using his wisdom, his understanding, and his knowledge. And we're taking what he has already placed in our hands. Remember Moses. All Moses had was a staff. Guess what that staff Joshua didn't get? All Joshua had was the teaching of Moses and the teaching of Aaron and Miriam. That's all he had. Oh, he had the anointing. He had the book of the law. We got the same thing. We got the teaching of who? All the almighty Jesus. We've got all oh, somebody. And Jesus says, what did I always say? What did Jesus say? Listen, listen, listen. He said, I was rich, but I became poor because you who were poor it can also be rich. Yeah. See, you have to begin to flow in this kingdom principle. Yeah. Because in my father's house, there are what? Mm -hmm. Many mansions. So why are we sitting around worrying about what Charlie has and, and looking at his stuff when the kingdom says you can have the very, very same things? Let's talk about some scriptures because some of you hadn't really got it yet. Now, write these down because we got to run. Matthew 6 and 33, very familiar. You're familiar with that one. Matthew 6 and 33. And then the one that I like is Psalms 112, 1 through 4. 112 and 1 through 4. That's Psalms. Now, Matthew 6 and 33 simply says this. But ye seek first, come on, his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Everything that you see, everything that they got, Jesus knows you want and need those things. Mm -hmm. But he don't want you to use the same methods that they do because you know they're crooked schemes. God wants you to flow in this. God wants to walk you through this. And he's going to do just that. Look at in Psalms 112, 1 through 4, he says, Notice, praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the man that feared the Lord, 
That's the first thing. That's one. He says, the, and then the next thing is delights, he says, greatly. And the third thing is in my commandments. If you just do those things, God says, if you just do those things and trust him, and trust him, the thing about trusting God is that you really have to trust God. <laughs> when things really get tough, you still got to trust. See, that's what they say. When it gets tough, the tough gets going. When it gets tough, the tough gets trusting God. See, and no matter what it is, if you trust him, he's going to work it out for you. You can't be double-minded, especially if you done started out with God. You got to go ahead and go through with it. Notice what he says here. Look at that Psalms 112, verse 1. He says, he says, Praise ye the Lord. That's the first thing. Praise God in, in spite of where you're at right now. Praise him. He said, then blessed, blessed, blessed is the man that fear me. And then the one that delight greatly in my boundaries. Uh, his seed shall be mighty upon the earth. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. See, you're upright. The just shall live by faith. And your faith is counted to you as righteousness. So then the upright shall be blessed. Wealth, here it is, here it is. Wealth and riches shall be in his house, in her house, and his righteousness endures forever. Upon the right, upon the upright, there arise light and the darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteousness. So there it is. He says that he would do this. I don't doubt him. What are the things that that I've seen, and I've said this before, that I have had to walk out. And, and, and there has been times, I, I remember times when I didn't, I, 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 you know, I, I didn't have no faith that God did it anyway. <laughs> because that, that's all I had. He knew I had nothing left. So he did it anyway. He said, now, he said, now do you believe? I said, yes, I do. Because he's going to do it. If you start out with him and stick with him, he's going to see you through it. The whole key is, and you say, and so there's no, listen to me, there's no quick scheme getting rid Themes with God. This is why I'm saying inch by inch, walk it out. You know what I'm saying? Walk it out, walk it out. You, you, you know this. So do just that. Walk it out with God. There's no quick, rich scheme. There, there are not many. And you say, well, wait a minute, Pastor. What about those guys that play the lottery? Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. And some of you probably played it. No worries. Because let me tell you, that's the world system. And the world system, there's a thing that they call when you gamble. Luck. But the opposite of luck is misfortune. Or better yet, bad luck. Now, how many folks you know that played a lottery have fell on the bad luck category? That money, that check done went to somebody else. It may not even have went to the winner because the system is set. Come on, somebody. For them to make all the money. Then they tell you another lie. Say we're going to give it to the kids. But then I know the crooked the crooked folks. All in, 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 in everywhere. When they're running it. They take a, oh, a big piece off the top. Oh they work it out. But at the end of the day. You're on the bad luck syndrome. So all this luck. That the world was telling you about. Because that's the world system. Who owns the world system? Did we forget the devil owns the world system. Remember when he took Jesus to the high place? He said, Jesus, if you worship me, boy, all these kingdoms of the world are mine. He said that the Lord has allowed me to have them if you fall down and worship me. Now, and Jesus being the wise, he said, you should worship no other God. Because Jesus understood one thing. The devil said, he has allowed this boy to have this, this worldly system, the devil. But God owns not only the world, but he owns all of it. Why would you be seeking the devil's system when God owns everything? And he owns all the wealth and the riches. That's the, so that's your lottery story. That's how you deal with the lottery. Because how many people do you know done won? Come on now, millions of dollars. How many people do you know? There you go, guys. That's a piece for yourself. I don't know. You know, it beats right there for itself. That's it. That's it. Because they all want bad luck. 
Here's the thing. I'm here to tell you today, there should be no more looking for crumbs underneath the table. Yeah. You know, yeah. When God wants you in his kingdom, he wants you to, to, to want his kingdom. Now, now let's look at a story. Y'all know where I'm going. Now let's go to Matthews 15, and we're going to take off at 22. God don't want you looking and having faith for crumbs. And that's what we do. A lot of mealy mouth Christians, we want we have faith from paycheck to paycheck. That's what we have faith for. But then we be robbing from God, don't we? We be robbing from God, but we want God to do. But I'm here to tell you, when you flow with God, he'll answer every prayer. He'll do it so magnificent, and then when he sends you stuff, he'll double it. He, he'll increase you. But look, at this, at this woman, and I looked it up. This particular woman, this is Matthew 15. You need to go here with me. We're going to take off at verse 21, actually. But this woman, she was a Gentile woman, but she was a Canaanite. Now, the thing about this Canaanite, she wasn't really much, she wasn't all. Canaanites, Canaanite people was like this. They're part Israel. <laughs> they're part uh, Syrian. Uh, and then they're part Lebanon. So she had Israelite blood in her, like we all do. But she didn't understand that. Because all she understood, she had faith for crumbs. That's what we do. We have faith for crumbs. We don't we have faith for paycheck to paycheck. And God wants us to have more faith than that. If you don't step out on faith, God can't get no glory from you. You too busy just thinking about, oh, if I could just make it tomorrow. That ain't, the, that ain't the type of God we serve. This woman only had faith for crumbs. Look at her. Let's look at this story. Come on. And 21, then Jesus went out from there and departed into the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan, comprised of, as I said, Lebanon and and she, she was a, from southern Syria, and she was an Israelite. She was part of the Transjordan. She came from that region and carried out and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demonized. But he answered her not a word. He, he was testing her. He, he didn't say anything to her. He was quiet because he wanted to see what she was made of. He wanted to see where she was going to be persistent. He was trying to see was she really ready to come out of the low thinking mentality, the poverty mentality. But here she is because she would probably been told all her life she couldn't be anything. And she wasn't going to be anything, so she couldn't have faith for anything. But here I'm changing that today. Because your faith is being activated. No more crumbs. No more crumbs. No more crumbs. No more crumbs. Notice, he, Jesus didn't say nothing to her. He says, all right, let me see what this girl's made of. He says, then he says, he didn't answer a word. And his disciples, notice, notice, his disciples, the world, uh, they all in the flesh urging her to shut up. You can't have what we got. What does the world always tell you? They always told you, you couldn't go here. You can't do that. You can't be educated. You can't have that. You can't go here. You owe somebody. You know, and then I, I love these uh, Ameritrade commercials. you see them when somebody's party and they got plenty of money and the other guy won what he's got. Well, somebody, it's a trick of the devil. Why? Because the person probably, they know that's just advertising, first of all. But let me tell you how that really works. If you don't know what you're doing in the stock market, don't get in it. And don't take no money that you know you got to pay a bill with and put it in the stock market. The devil will laugh at you as he takes your money. You got to know what you're doing. You just can't go out there and do something you don't know what you're doing. You'll fall down and hurt yourself. As they say, you know enough to hurt yourself. You don't do that. People that, that the, the rich people that play the market, 
guess what? They got plenty to play with. That ain't what you do. That ain't how God called you to roll. You, first of all, God's got to trust you. And if you want to learn about that, if that's something that you want to pursue, then study. <clears throat> Take some classes. Google, YouTube, anything you want to do. Study. And then if you're still interested in it, then put $10 or $20, something that ain't going to hurt you, something that you ain't going to miss. This is common sense. And then you take that and you watch God move on it and you trust God for it. If that's what you want to do, if that's where you're, that's how you're going to roll. But notice whatever it was that you took, you better make sure that you've already tied it to God because you're going to need him to bless you in this. Yeah. Look at this one. He says, so then, and his disciples was urging him to, don't say nothing. Send her away, master, for she's cried out after us. They, they, they thought this woman wanted them. <laughs> That's what the world do. We don't want the world. We want Jesus. Get out of the way, devil. <laughs> and you know folks be that don't go to church <laughs> because they don't want you to get to Jesus. They are afraid that you're going to get more than they got. Come on. And that's exactly what this woman was doing. She, she, she made up mind. I can give her that much. But her faith was distorted. Mm -hmm. Because she only trusted God for crumbs. She only trusted God for crumbs. Mm -hmm. And the thing about that, let me tell you, saints, and I shared this with you many times before. If you want to stay where you at, God will bless you right there. If you want to waddle in mess, and talk about, oh, I can't make it. Oh, somebody, Sally Sue is hey, holding me back, Lord. I, I can't get to church today, Lord. I'm never going to be blessed. So someday I might have something. Stay right there. Because of his love and because of his grace, he's going to leave you right there. Right there. Because that's what you choose to do. This woman chose to have faith for crumbs. And guess what? He blessed her with the crumbs. Watch this. He says, so the world, the disciples, they were, like, they were in the flesh telling her, oh, you don't need Jesus. But he answered and said, I, I was not sent except to the lost sheep, first of all. And she didn't realize that she was Israel. She had some Israelite blood in her. She didn't realize that. And then, so he says, he tells her, he says, I'm sent to the lost sheep, the house of Israel. Right there, she said, wait a minute, Master. I'm Israel. <laughs> I'm entitled to the same house. And, and then he goes on further. He's still testing her. He's trying to see if her faith is strong enough to bleed for more. But she, all she needs, all she wants is crumbs. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. Let me just help me, Lord. I just got this little situation. But he answered and said, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the, to the little dogs. Note, he said to the little dogs. And he said the children's bread. She was entitled to the children's bread. Why? Because she was in the kingdom. But she didn't understand who she was. And so here's her thing. He says, it's not good to take to the children's bread and to throw it to the little dogs. And she said, yes, Lord. Yes, even the little dogs eat the crumbs. So she accepted. I'm almost mad at her. Because she accepted the first, she accepted three things in her life. She accepted the fact that she was little. Then she accepted the fact that she was a dog. Then she accepted the fact that she, all she gets is crumbs. And that's what we do. Kind of mentality. You are in the kingdom of God. You should want more than just crumbs in your life. God has so much for you. Don't be like this woman with very little bit of faith. That's all she trusted God for. I stopped years ago because I had to. When I took off, in my business, I had, to, I had to trust God for a lot of things. And my wife was always saying, are you going to take it? I said, no, baby. I said, I've got to have contracts. It's got to be 30 or, 
of 50,000 or I can't make it. <laughs> you keep <can't really> doing <laughs> But I had made up in my mind because why? I had dealt with corporate America. I had seen these boys make big money. I wanted big money because I deserve big money. I spoke to God every day about this big money. I said, I got to have it, Lord. I need it too. And finally, hallelujah, he broke, hallelujah. It broke. The level broke. That glass ceiling broke. I used to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with owners. They were making 20 million. I stand toe-to-toe -to -toe and say, you need what I got. Yeah. Yeah. You had to get like that. And then they begin to respect me. And now I don't talk to them unless you're making 2.5, I'll come see you. But you have to gain the mentality. You can't have the mentality of somebody that's going to deal and be settled for crumbs. Yeah. That ain't who you are. You're in the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of the world. Yeah. Yeah. Here's the deal. This woman, but he answered and said, it is good, he says, to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. It's not good. And she says, Lord, I'll accept it. And she said, yes, Lord, even the little dogs and the crumbs, I'll take it. That's all. I, that's all I'm worth, Lord. And Jesus answered and said, so be it to you. Woman, your faith has allowed you to have just that. <laughs> That's all she wanted. That was her level of faith. Your faith can't rise no higher than you want it to. <clears throat> if you want to stay there, God will leave you there. But here's the thing. If you want more from God, He wants to give you more. But you got to go after Him. If you want to be closer, draw closer. If you want more faith, draw closer. If you want more faithfulness, this is the key. This is why I'm always, Brother Randolph, no, I'm always talking about faithfulness. Because let me tell you something. When you're faithful, when you're faithful, when you're committed, when you're made the vow, who makes the vow? Who's the author of vows? The Lord is the author of a vow. If you're faithful, if you're faithful with what you're doing, if you're faithful with serving God, if you're faithful, then God is faithful to you. Faithfulness begot faithfulness. Come on! Money begot it all the same principle. A good life, guess what? Begot a good life. Yeah. Faithful to God. Because that's who he... Oh, somebody. Uh, I know a woman right now. She refused to go. And I said, when is she going to leave? And I thought God reminded me. Remember the nagging woman and the unjust judge. Oh, somebody. The woman had pressure. She had pressure. <laughs> she had pressure issues. <laughs> she liked to press in. <laughs> she, but the judge didn't know God, didn't like God, didn't want to worship God. But one thing he feared about this woman, she pressed. She pressed and said, you gonna give me what I deserve. This is what I, this is what you owe me. This is my right, somebody, because I'm in the kingdom of God. I demand it. And guess what? The unjust just said, oh, somebody. I got to give this woman what she deserves, what she's asking, what she's pressing, what she's not giving up on. And she kept pressing and she kept believing. And guess what? Jesus turned around and told her, he says, he says, listen, if you press into God this way. My God won't hold no good thing from you. Yeah, yeah. This is how this is how we get to the millionaire mentality. Millionaires press in. Millionaires take the little and make it much. Every millionaire story, listen to them. I had this little bit and I invested it. You know, and if you look at the sharks, that's all but the one lady talks about. I studied it $1,000 and she's just so cute with you. I studied it one time and I'm saying, you're lying. <laughs> you know, I know somebody helped her. You know, we know that. We know oh, somebody. You know the game ain't fair. Come on. <laughs> you know, some people start on third base and we ain't even got to the first yet. But that's all right. <laughs> because God, hallelujah, is going to knock a home run for us. Amen. 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 That's what, see, that's the difference between the world accepts system and
and God's kingdom. Yes. See, here's the thing. You know, again, I say, why do we settle for crumbs when God wants to give us his kingdom? Why does he do that? Why do we do that? Now look at, go with me to Luke 12, 32. You need to write these down because these are some that you can use. You, you can use when the enemy comes and tells you, oh, that's not for me. Luke 12, 32, he says, Fear not, little flock. Fear not, little flock. For it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. See, it is his pleasure to give you this wealth. It is his pleasure for you to have these things. Yeah. It is his good pleasure for you. He wants you to have them. But he wants you to have faith. He wants you to chase him. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, like I said, there was one time I didn't have him, but I chased him. I didn't know whether what was, or what I was going, what I was up. But I chased him. I prayed. I sought after him. Because he, he was all I had. <laughs> it had come to that. And it, it, it came to like, hey, God, for God I live, God I die. He started saying that. Okay, well, I'm, I'm out. I'm out. <laughs> if you don't help me, I'm, I'm out. <laughs> the matter is trust in God mm -hmm. because of his kingdom. He said, oh, little flock, not to worry. <laughs> I got you in this. I want you to trust me. I want you to have my kingdom. Because my kingdom supersedes the devil's kingdoms of the world. See, when we begin to get like that, that's when God begins to move. That's when things open, doors open that you say, well, man, I don't even know how that happened. And y'all experienced some things like that in your past when you don't know how you got there. And God did that because you were flowing in his kingdom principles. You're understanding some things about him. Here's the deal. You know, we fear about anything. That's what we do, men and women. We look for anything to fear. And we know, last week I told you, fear is nothing but false evidence of people. You know, we'll fear the economy. Oh, somebody. We have fear, we got fear of failure. Oh, somebody. We got fear of financial crisis. Please understand that the devil would want nothing more than to grip your heart with fear to keep you from feeling the destiny and the call that God has on your life. That's all he wants. It's his 24-7 to send you fear. So you won't step out with God when you're truly trusting God. Now let me tell you, God knows this. This is why I preference what I did in the beginning. This is what God knows about all of us. Where your heart is is where your treasure is. Watch this. Who looks at the heart? God. <laughs> where your heart is is where your treasure is. So God is going to look. That's because that's where your treasure is. He knows that. Then he's going to look at you again and say, okay, I'm going to speak to your mind about your treasure. Or are you going to give me my tent? Are you going to, are you going to apply what you need to me because the tent wasn't yours in the beginning? This is not, no, somebody, don't, don't get me wrong. This is not a tied message. This is a millionaire's message. Every millionaire always gives 10% of that. The Rockefellers, right there, they taught their children. They said, they sit them down. Let me tell you what they did with their children in the very beginning. This is why all of them have money, even today. He sit them down. He says, you're going to give a third to charity. You're going to give a third to some church organization. You're going to tie it to the church. And then you're going to take a third and invest it in whatever you want. He taught them principles of how to stay rich. How to not only have wealth, but to keep wealth. Because mm -hmm. wealth can come and go. Yeah. We see that. But this is the principle of millionaires. You must, I say, give what belongs to God. If you don't, then ain't no need to question God. So, well, God, why my stuff? I didn't give it to you, but the enemy stole it. Uh, I didn't tie it to you, Lord, but then I wrote down the road in here. Mm. Policeman, stop you. He cost you not only your tithe, <laughs> but a double of your trouble. Because and then when you think, then he was on you. Then when you had to go to court, 
You think I should have gave that to God, this wouldn't have happened. Come on. Come on. Oh, somebody, let me tell you, you know, I'm going to be honest with you. When I was a teenager, I didn't get this revelation. I was in young 20s. This is before I went to the service because I was, you know, I needed to go somewhere. <laughs> Otherwise, I was going to hell. Come on. <laughs> but nevertheless, uh, this is a revelation. This is where God got a ticket. And God said, now you was at church yesterday. If you'd have tied it to me, I'd have kept you from this. So this is a reality check. Because, or, or, another scenario, you didn't, you, and you could have gave it to God and gotten blessed by it, but then you didn't bless, you didn't give it to God, and then, guess what? The electric company call you and say, you owe me double for last month. Hmm. Or, or the phone, up, they done went up. You know how, to, you remember how AT&T just used to go up, they got sued. But they, oh, man, they go up at the $20, $30, what the? <laughs> <laughs> you know? And then, then you said that, then you owe somebody. But then, but when you tie, <laughs> I pick up the phone and say, whoa, you don't tell me. Oh, Mr. O, you no problem. We're going we're gonna to discount that, and we're going to, matter of fact, we're going to give you a discount, and we're going to credit you on your next bill. <laughs> Somebody! <laughs> See, this is, when this is God. This is how the millionaire principle worked. I got to get right in your Kool-Aid today. <laughs> So here, here. So then he says, this is what we fear everything. We need to understand that the, the devil wants to grip you in that area. Write this one down, Ecclesiastes 11 and 4. See, we fear everything. This is, and this is why we don't step out. I like this one. Ecclesiastes 11 and 4. Just write it down. I'm going to read it. He says, he that observes the wind shall not sow. <laughs> he that regarded the cloud shall not reap. Oh, somebody. Oh, Pastor, I can't come to church. The wind is blowing. <laughs> you can't even see the wind. How you know it's blowing? <laughs> you try to determine where the wind, how's it going, and you don't have no clue. Oh, somebody. <laughs> oh, Pastor, I can't get I can't go here because the clouds are blue. Oh, somebody. How can you get anything worried about the wind and the clouds when God owns the wind and the clouds? Yeah. Oh, somebody. <laughs> See, we, we, we got to get out of the poor man mentality. It starts flooding the millionaire. The reason God told Joshua to take the people across the Jordan is because the people were satisfied in the land of just enough. Mm -hmm. They were satisfied. My question to you, are you satisfied where you're at? I'm not. I'm not satisfied. See, one thing God told me, I can never stop being a pastor. I got to die. <laughs> Instead of that, because I'm a pastor for life. I'm in the ministry for life. I'm in the kingdom then for life. So in that, in that, in that respect, then I'm a citizen for life. I, I, I expect the same thing. You know what? Let me tell you about a king. If you ever seen a king, and some of you have seen some movies, but the king in his kingdom always takes care of his citizens. And he does it for his great name's sake. <laughs> Why? Because he don't want his name tarnished. Mm -hmm. So he takes care of his citizens because he don't want his citizens in poverty. Uh-oh. Hey, so then therefore, he even, and then he, he makes them ambassadors because they're, they're his. They're his. They belong to him. So he's going to take care of them. So citizens in the kingdom have inalienable rights, don't they? They have rights to what? All of the wealth of the kingdom. All the things that the kingdom have. The citizens, mind you. Not the folks that are not citizens, but the actual citizens. Mm -hmm. hey, you ever been to a real kingdom and seen, uh, seen, this, this, seen the royal courts? They're all sitting around with robes. And they don't do nothing but receive the blessings of what God has for them. Most kingdoms, like England, they collect from the peasants. Uh-oh. <laughs> but the good citizens is the one that has all the treasures. So we don't want to be no peasants. We want to be a real citizen of the kingdom because we have rights. <clears throat> so God, again, told Joshua, 
He told them to cross over your Jordan. See your banks. Put some money in the new banks. But they were satisfied with just enough. They were satisfied with living day to day. They were satisfied with living paycheck to paycheck. The land of low living. And the land it got me to be. Matter of fact, it made God mad. He said, I'm tired of you sitting around here doing nothing. He said, I've been feeding you with, with man and quail. I gave you the cloud and the pillar and, and, and everything by night. He says, I done gave you all this stuff. Now you need to go out and do something for yourself. I done trained you enough. I done gave you good leaders. And you rebelled in the process. But that's all right. I still loved you. But I got to get you. Since you don't want to get out of the low living, let me give you somebody that's going to take you out of the low living. Mm -hmm. yes. Let me give you somebody that's going to want you to be a millionaire. Yes. Let me give you somebody that's going to stop playing with your mind. Yes. And make you realize your full potential. Come out of the low living. Just like Joshua, God wants you want to help you get to the promised land. Joshua led the people to the promised land. God wants to lead you today to the promised land. Mm -hmm. But you've got to come out of that low thinking mentality, that pocket. See, that's what elevation was about last week. So if you need to listen to elevation, you need to go and listen to that. Because you need to be elevated. And here's the thing. Faith says, watch this, this is why the, this is why the prophet speaks the way he does and why God calls the prophet. Faith says that provisions prophesize provisions. Let me say that again. See, I'm prophesying the provisions. I'm prophesying the millionaire mentality. I'm prophesying against the low man and the low land mentality. Against that. But I'm prophesying provisions. I'm telling you simple things to do. Simple things to do to start walking in prosperity. Because let me tell you something. Line upon line. Precept upon precepts. We studied that, didn't we? When you do the little, oh, somebody, when you do the little, then God can bless that and give you much. Mm -hmm. But don't rob from God. Because he, he can't bless it. So if you got a dollar, give God ten, can give God ten cents. And notice what he says. Provisions prophesy provision. Supply is a prophetic indication of future supply. <laughs> That's good. I like that. Supply is a study prophetic indication of future supply. But this one's better. And victory is the past. The victory in the in your past is a prophetic indication of victory in the future. So when, well, somebody, when you get, oh, somebody, this is what prophecy is. It's just prevail, it's pro propelling you in the future. It's allowing you to stretch out, come on, and, 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 and know that God is going to do this for you. Now let me say all three of these again, because somebody needs to get it. Faith, then, is that provisions prophesies provisions. Supply is a prophetic indication of future supply. And the victory in the past, your victory in the past, the victory that you had in the past is a prophetic indication of victory in your future. We have got to come out of the someday syndrome. A lot of us have been in the someday syndrome. Someday I'll go to church and see what that man is talking about and, and all that. We've got to come away from that syndrome. Someday I'll have more than enough. Someday I'll be healed. And someday I will walk in my blessings. When's that day coming? If you ain't, oh, somebody, let me go here. If you ain't got no goal, and a dream, what did I say? A dream is nothing but a goal with a deadline. I don't care if you set the goal and the deadline ain't met. When you get there, create a new deadline. Tell somebody. You go back and pray again. 
And in most cases, you will find if you set a deadline, if you said, oh, God, I'm, I need to do this in six months. And let's suppose that the total, because that's usually what happens, because God knows, doesn't he? And especially when we gave it to God. If you said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to be this in six months, maybe that wasn't quite as realistic as it needed to be. It didn't meet your means. You wasn't quite ready yet. It's just like saying, I'm going to have a new car in six months. That is a wonderful go. But you, you, you put a deadline on it. I'm going to have it in this. But notice, notice in that process, when you reach that goal, other things have happened. You've accumulated extra money to pay for the car. You have begun to inch to, to it. So God knows when you actually possess, possess the car, then you're not struggling with it. Because you had a goal as to when you were going to achieve it. Not a Sunday syndrome with nothing attached to it. There's no meaning to it. See, God, he handles this this way. Look at, write down 2 Corinthians 6 and 1. 6 and 1. That's 2 Corinthians 6 and 1. There's, God doesn't deal in a Sunday syndrome because that's not the kind of God we serve. God has a goal and a deadline for you. 2 Corinthians 6 and 1 says, As God's co-worker, there you are, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you. In other words, God heard your request. You're in the kingdom. And in the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you now, in the same time of God's favor. Somebody say, in this time. In this time. God's favor. God's favor. Now, now is the day of my salvation. Of my salvation. There it is right there. So you can't, you no more someday, I don't take it out of your vocabulary, get rid of the someday syndrome. Someday I'm going to be wealthy. Oh, forget that. You're going to be wealthy. <laughs> Ain't no more guessing. You're walking in the millionaire mentality. Why? Because you are walking in the kingdom principles. This is what God is getting ready to do. Finally, to really understand the true concept of God's riches in your life is to avoid greed. To avoid the greed. The reason people don't sow seeds is greed. I said that. In other words, withholding for your own use that which actually belongs to God. There it is. You're keeping for yourself what belongs to God. You know worse than, you, you know what? You know better off than Cain. Let me help you. <laughs> Cain and Abel, remember that? <laughs> Abel, here he was out there barbecuing his meat. <laughs> he took the fresh cut on the lamb and put that bad boy on some coals and dressed it and said, God, this is for you, man. I said, okay, I'm well pleased with you, boy. Cain, on the other hand, he was a farmer. He grew out of all the fruit trees, and he picked the basket, and I can see him now. He picked the bad figs. <laughs> he picked the end of good fruit that he put in the basket. He was eating some of them along the way, throwing them on the side. <laughs> you know, you can imagine what he was doing. Then he get to God and throw that stuff on out. God said, boy, I, I come to hide on my plea with this. <laughs> I don't want it. I don't want it. You wouldn't have wanted it. <laughs> he told Cain, he probably said, you, don't, you eat it. <laughs> I don't want that mess. <laughs> He said, but I'm not, he said, but I still love you. And then he gets mad because nobody don't want that stuff. How many folks you know like that? You don't know how to use that crap. You know, <laughs> you know, and then they get mad at you. <laughs> want you to take low living stuff. Oh, somebody. You're a king, you're a queen. You don't take no low living stuff. Yeah, it, it, listen, I had to learn this the hard way. Some money ain't good money. You don't, you, now listen, you don't throw good money at the bad. Even, listen, even the Pharisees knew that. <laughs> Judas Zacharias, 
He came back so man, I done, I, done, I done really messed up. Oh, I mean, I don't want this money y'all gave me. No, they said, boy, we, we paid you for Jesus. We paid you for that. We, we paid you, man. And, and he says, well, I don't want the money. He threw it back. He threw it back to him on the ground. They took him out and said, man, we can't touch this money. <laughs> that bad money. <laughs> he said, what can we do with this bad money? We can't even touch it. And they, then they hired a servant. Come in and get this money and go to make a burial ground. <laughs> they, they said, the money wasn't no good. Man, they could have got that with bad money. That's true. Wow. You, that's why you can't throw good money at the bad. So you must always understand as a millionaire, we're always, we always got to be flowing. You know, some, sometimes you got to cut your losses. I've done that. When, when the enemy sneaks in, and he will, forgive. Let go. Let go. God says in his word, he, he covers that too. He says if you find a thief, and you know he's a thief, God says, he'll repay you after repay you sevenfold. That's the word. So let God repay you. Yeah. Tell him to bless him and leave that individual, that person alone. Let it go. God will fix it. There's been many times in my life whereas I thought people ripped me off. And on my way home, I called my wife. She said, did they? I said, no. I said, but it's okay. I said, because I gave it to God. A year later, same customer says, he needed me to fix a problem. I says, no, no, no worries. I says, and I'm thinking in the back of my mind, you owe me. <laughs> but I didn't say that because I had given it to God. What happened was, he was so nice and so polite. He says, Whatever you need to do, William, whatever you need to do, here's my credit card. Doesn't matter. Whatever you need to do to get us up and running again in our stores. I took that credit card and I said, whatever I need to do. So the first thing I'm thinking, this guy owes me. <laughs> Let me get that first. <laughs> then, he, then I called back. I said, is this how he says, yeah, did I? I charged it again. He says, is this okay? He says, well, don't I need dust, dust? I said, you certainly do. Zip. <laughs> but what I'm saying, so I got triple. I got triple because he wanted to do it. God had turned his heart toward me. That's the point that I'm making. Let God fight this thing for you. You are a millionaire mentality. Don't chase after folks when you know they're devils. That's what they want. They want you in the flesh with them. So they can bring you down to their level. And you're not in the, you're no longer in the low level thinking. You don't get down in the mud anymore. The devil tried that with Jesus on the high place. Oh, Jesus, jump off this stuff. Boy, get with me. I'm a king's kid. I, I, I own you. You're going to serve me. That's what he's supposed to do, saints. He's supposed to serve you. So he says here, we need to get away from trying to take that from God. So he says, don't withhold what belongs to God, that which belongs to him for yourself. Proverbs, write this one down. Proverbs chapter 3, because we're almost done. <coughs> Proverbs chapter 3. 9 and 12. Write this one down. And look what Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 and 10. Notice what he says here. This is wisdom. Honor the Lord your God with your wealth. There it is. Last week I gave an example of honoring God with your wealth. How? You, you say, well, Pastor, I don't have much to honor God with, then honor God with that. I, the analogy I gave, and it's, it's out there on the elevation uh, tape. I said this. If God gives you a car, then you need to give God 10% of the car. 10% of the car is simply, why don't you start at the driver's seat? You're the driver. Dedicate that to God. 
If you dedicate 10% of the car to God and you're praying to God every day, you're saying, God, this is your car. I dedicate this 10% to you. All you're doing is speaking. And God sees that by your faith, so he takes control of your car. Now he keeps folks from banging into you. He keeps lights from changing red when they need to be green on your behalf. <laughs> Come on! You ever worn down the road and all the lights were green and you had to be somebody? You said, man, I know that was God. <laughs> I had to be God. <laughs> Thank you, God. <laughs> you know how it is. So you're praying in your car and you're writing. So if you don't gave that 10% to God and you're praying, guess what? You, you know my old saying, I say this all the time, if you let the devil ride, he'll want to drive. Don't pick up no devils. <laughs> don't pick up no devils. Especially when you have dedicated your car 10%, 10%, that's all he requires, because that's his. You don't own that. So since you're in the driver's seat, say, God, I'll give you the wheel. <laughs> give you the brakes. <laughs> Let me give you the tires, my man. And by the way, God, when I take my car to the shop, I want a zero balance. Uh oh. <laughs> I, I tried that. That works. <laughs> Come on, somebody. You're our kingdom kid. You got to flow in the millionaire mentality. And, and you know, uh, y'all know I drive Cadillac, and here's the deal. Those folks come in there, man. They come in there, and they expect things. Because a lot of them come in there, they rich. Y'all know them, debutantes. They come in, they come into the service. They, they come in there just sitting down. And they expect service. And the little people run out there, you need a coffee. <laughs> you need something to drink. <laughs> and one time this old lady, she heard her sound like, God, everything she had been having, you could tell it was, was a, it was a real big one, nice one. And the little boy, he had charged her like $20 for something. And she says, I'm not paying that. I'm just not paying it. That's all she had to say, man. And everybody ran out there to her. And they said, boy, get on me. I went, take that off my bill. <laughs> I tried that too. I said, like, I ain't paying that. They said, okay, Mr. Jelly, take me a minute more, call me on. I said, man. <laughs> when you flow like the millionaires flow, you take the same attitude when you're in the old stomach. Like, Come on. When you begin to flow like that, Oh, somebody. Yeah. But let me tell you something else about humility in this thing because most millionaires, and I'm going to tell you something, most millionaires and people that have lots of money, they're very humble. Mm -hmm. They're very humble. I tried that too. I went to, took my wife to, to Zaxby's. <laughs> <laughs> One of those rich restaurants, come on. <laughs> no. <laughs> and they were closing, but she was hungry. I was all over. And I said, baby, this is all we got tonight now. You got to work with me. So I went there, and she said, I'll just order what you want. <laughs> so she ordered what she wanted. So I ordered what I wanted. And we get there, and they were like five minutes closing. And, and I get there, and the guy did not have the wings. And so the manager came up, and I told him, be humble. I said, we're kingdom kids. So let's flow in this. So she got quiet. I said, now just be humble. Be nice. And the guy even said, uh, would you, you know how to do, would you wait? Because we, we, we were closing and I just found out, manager, I just found out that your wings are not, they, they didn't, we didn't have it. We hadn't thrown them in the thing. And, but they, he, I said, they're going to be fresh. He said, yeah. So, of course, my wife being the person she is, she said, well, what do we get for free? <laughs> <laughs> the guy says, well, ma'am, I had already given him a great. She said, ma'am, I'll give you a free solar. And I said, okay, give us that. And I said, I'm quiet. <laughs> so, so she says, <laughs> you know, she <laughs> Y'all have to understand my wife. She flows with this millionaire and but when I take her places like this, she just kind of like, you know, she, you know, anyway. But nevertheless, we, we get, we, I tell her, be humble, be humble, be nice. So the whole time I'm, I'm being nice. Tell this guy, I said, that's okay. So we roll over to the side and we get over there and I said, let me just, just 
Because she was hungry. <laughs> so her flesh was like, you know, you know <laughs> she's wearing those snicker commercial guy. <laughs> Y'all going to tell her she's going to beat me up. You know? <laughs> I know some of y'all say, I'm going to tell her I get back. <laughs> I love her to death. Y'all know that. But anyway, long story short, here's the deal. We're sitting there, and I'm saying, just you know, when we get to talking, and folks know we laughing and everything, and you know, we come and everything. And then guy walks out. And I said, Well, okay. I said, Thank you. I said, Let me check everything. Everything was perfect. It's fresh. They had done the wings so perfectly. And the manager came out, and the, he had the guy standing there, and they waited until we checked. There. I said, Well, thank you so much, sir. We really appreciate it. I said, I'm going to try not to come up here at this hour ever again. You see what I'm saying? And he appreciated that. And of course, we appreciated the food because when we got home, it was great. It was great. So my point is, that's the other key. Humility. Humility in all of this. That's when Jesus was. Jesus was a rich king, but this boy was totally humble. So here's the thing. Honor the Lord with your wealth with the first fruit of your crop. Then your barns will be filled with overflowing and your vats with brim over with new wine. Remember the commandments, one of the boundaries, thy shall not steal. If you do, let's go to Malachi and then we're done. Malachi is really good. It's, it's a good read. I recommend it. Remember the boundaries, or what are the commandments? I shall not steal. If you do, Malachi chapter 3, let's take off at verse 8. He says this, Will a mere mortal rob God? In other words, we are mortals. Will we rob the Almighty God who owns everything, who gives us everything liberally? Would you rob me? You said, well, no, God won't rob you. But you ask, how are you robbing me then in your tithes and offerings, he says. You are under a curse if you do this, your whole nation, because you are robbing me, he says. Bring then the whole tithe, the whole tithe, into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me then in this, saith the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour you out so much, so much, somebody say so much, so much. blessing that you will not have room to receive it or store it up. That's the key. That's why he says, my cup runneth over. When God deals your cup,